Welcome to the Comic Stands podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, my name is Seth Tabachman. Um, I'm a comic book artist, um, a publisher, a political activist, and a teacher. Now, of the comics that you've done, what would people know you from? Uh, probably the most well-known of my books is this one, You Don't Have to Fuck People Over to Survive, uh, which was published originally um, in 1989 um, and then has been through successive um, reprintings. So it's been through four different three different publishers, four different publications. It was reprinted originally by Pressure Drop Press and then reprinted by Soft Skull Press and is now published by AK Press. Um, and also the image from the cover, the stencil that says, you don't have to fuck people over to survive, um, that became a very popular t-shirt in the 80s and 90s and was used um, to raise funds for a number, of, a number of different organizations, particularly the long haul info shop in Berkeley. Um, so that's probably the most well-known thing I did. Uh, they're very often people who have um, that image on a t-shirt or a patch or even as a tattoo and may not even know who did it. Um, but I've done a number of other books since then, um, including War in the Neighborhood, uh, which was about the squatter movement in the 1980s and many more recent books. Um, you Don't Have to Fuck People Over to Survive was essentially a collection of the work I did in the 1980s that was published in my magazine, World War III Illustrated, uh, that was self-published and then was collected into a book by uh, Pressure Drop Press. And it deals a lot with not only the political issues, but the moral issues posed by the Reagan era, the gentrification of the cities. Um, the, um, it deals a lot with police brutality, police violence against black people. Um, apartheid in South Africa, the move bombing, um, all the issues that came up in the 80s, but also um, the sort of um, moral issues brought up in that period, the focus on uh, self-interest and uh, the abandonment of compassion that were part of that period. Now, you mentioned you're a teacher. Do you want to tell people where you teach and, wh and what you teach? I teach a comics course at, in the Department of Cartooning and Illustration at School of Visual Arts. Um, I also teach a course specifically for people who want to do political comics, um, and that's taught through ABC No Rio um, and is currently being held at the Museum of Reclaimed Urban Space because ABC No Rio is currently without an address. Their building is being rebuilt, uh, but the course it can, is available for, through the abcnorio.org website. So as a professor of comics. Not a professor, I'm an instructor. <laughs> My apologies. As a- I, as, The word is adjunct, but we never use the word adjunct at SBA. <laughs> okay. Uh, as an instructor of comics, you're perhaps uniquely qualified to answer this question. Uh, what are comics, in your opinion? How would you describe the medium? Ah, comics. Um, comics is, are um, it's a narrative art form um, that evolved um, in around the beginning of the 20th century um, involving a series of pictures uh, printed on paper, um, usually combining words and pictures to tell a story. Um, 
it has some influence from uh, the cinema, which was developing at the same time, uh, developed simultaneously with comics. <coughs> some influence, a significant influence from drawing and painting, particularly 19th century drawing and painting, um, and some influence from literature, but it's an art form in its own right um, that's developed uh, over the course of the 20th century. Now, in some places, you're described as a radical. Uh, do you agree with that characterization? I find it, I think it's complimentary. Uh, people can decide how radical I am, but I, I find that to be a compliment. Um, <clears throat> I, um, you know, I'm an anti-racist. I'm concerned about climate change. Um, I'm concerned about the lack of affordable housing in this society. And I have been involved in political organizing on all those issues. I mean, so that makes me a radical, fine with me. I mean, it's all contextual, right? Uh, in some places, Bernie Sanders is a radical and in Northern Europe, his policies would just be considered common sense. Yeah, that's right. Uh, anarchists at the beginning of the 20th century had crazy ideas like the eight hour workday and um, the right to abortion. Now those are standard liberal concerns. Very few people, only a small minority of people uh, want to take away the right of women to an abortion and almost nobody wants to get rid of the eight hour workday. Now, do you consider your work political? Um, a lot of it. Um, a lot of it was inspired by concern for politics. Although not exclusively political. I, I mean, I, I'm concerned with, you know, basic artistic concerns of style and presentation, you know, um, but I draw on a lot of political subject material and I respond to the political forces in society. What, what subject matter inspires you or attracts you? Um, it's been different at different points in my life. Um, you know, I, um, when I was younger, I saw myself as coming out against, um, against the Reagan era and against um, the Cold War. Um, and that, that was my jumping off point. And then I became very aware of police brutality issues um, with the death of various people in our community here, such as Michael Stewart, who was a young artist who went to the same school I did. Um, you know, so I became aware of those issues and that became something that was also a focus. Um, more recently, um, I've also tried to cover other things, you know. Um, you know, in, in the 80s, I was primarily dealing with issues in a broad abstract sense. And then in the 90s, I'd had a lot of um, life experience as an activist with, um, you know, the squatters movement in the Lower East Side. So I started to do more autobiographical comics that covered my own activities. And right now, for instance, I'm doing a book about, I'm working on a book about um, my mother and my father and, you know, the end of their lives and how that affected me. So it's a more personal book, but I think it also has some political context. So basically whatever is around me and whatever is in front of me, I respond to it and try to make art out of my feelings about it. So I'd like to talk about your, your history with the medium. Can you, uh, do you remember what the first comics you read were? Sure. Um, I, I was a big fan of Marvel superhero comics when I was a, in grade school and middle school. Um, I really connected to some of the characters. Um, 
you know, they were an escape for me. Like, I think a lot of people of my generation got into comic books, superhero comics, because we were kids who were being bullied. And um, it became a way of dealing with that experience, the experience of violence, the experience of conflict you have when you're a kid and very little of, you know, the so-called children's literature of our time dealt with that, you know, that people wanted their kids to read books about happy families and, you know, fairy tales and magical stuff. And we were, you know, getting beaten to the pavement uh, every week. So the, the superheroes were a way of dealing with that. Uh, when I was a kid, I would come home from school and I would imagine I was the Incredible Hulk and knock over all the furniture and then put it back up before my mother got home, you know? So that was the first stuff I related to was Marvel Comics. And um, then as I got older, you know, I kind of grew out of that. I started to recognize that, you know, the plot lines were essentially the same plot lines repeating over and over again. And I started to look into other types of literature, um, you know, read a lot of modern literature, read William Burroughs, read, um, you know, um, James Joyce, um, became interested in cubism and futurism, things like that, um, became very affected by the work of Ralph Steadman uh, when I was in my 20s. Um, and so I expanded out of that and looked for other subject material. And, um, you know, eventually became very interested in political subject material as an expansion of what I could do with comics. Of the, the superhero comics that you were reading, were there any creators that you were particularly drawn to? Um, well, I read lots of Jack Kirby and lots of Jim Steranko. I think Jim Steranko affected my sense of layout a great deal. Um, I also, as a comic book fan, developed a friendship with Jeff Jones and Vaughn Bodie, um, now, now Jeffrey Catherine Jones, um, who were fascinating people to me. Um, of course, I didn't have a word for transsexual at that time, um, but I was aware that they drew pictures of beautiful women and they looked like the beautiful women in their art. And um, I learned a lot from them. Um, they were very supportive of me taking experimental approaches to comics. So I should mention uh, to listeners that the, the, interview, the interview immediately prior to this one was with your friend, Peter Cooper. And your careers and your histories dovetail with each other quite a bit. Uh, Peter Cooper did mention that I believe when you guys were in junior high, you, you started your own zines, your own yeah. comic zines. We published uh, a couple of different fan zines when we were in uh, what is now called middle school and what was then called junior high. Um, one was called Fanzine. It was simply called Fanzine with a PH instead of an F. And then we also took over the newsletter of the um, Cleveland Graphic Arts Society, which was a comics club in the city of Cleveland. Um, and we became the editors of that newsletter for three issues um, where we published a lot of interviews with comic book artists. Um, and, um, you know, that, that gave us a chance to get closer contact with a lot of comic book artists, really. Um, and, uh, and we went to conventions and we were part of comic book fandom at that time. Um, and it also gave me some experience with self-publishing and learning how to prepare things for a printer um, and those sorts of questions, which would be helpful later on in doing our own comic book, World War III Illustrated. Now, at the time that you were doing these zines, did you already have a sense that comics was something you wanted to pursue as an adult, as a creator? 
Um, for me, um, you know, one of the one of the really meaningful things to me about Marvel Comics was that at the front of the magazine they had a list of the artists and writers and inkers on every issue. And that made me aware that there were these people who did this for a living. And um, one of the things I was good at in grade school and middle school was drawing. You know, there are a lot of things I wasn't good at, frankly, you know, but this was one of the things I was fairly good at. And that made me aware that you could be an artist and do that for a living. And of course, my parents would always tell me, nobody makes a living doing artwork. And I said, wait a second, these guys do. And when we went to the Detroit Triple Fanfare um, in the late 60s, I believe, um, we met a whole lot of the younger comic book artists, um, Jeff Jones, Vaughn Bodie. Bernie Wrights and Marv Wolfman. And, you know, they'd all come from New York in a little Volkswagen uh, bug, you know, and, you know, they obviously weren't making a lot of money, but they seemed like the happiest people I'd ever seen. I was like, yeah, I want to be just like those guys. I want to, you know, make my living drawing comics. So yeah, that idea, which we got from the comic books that, yes, you can make a living drawing pictures, was very attractive to us as young men. And you ended up going to school for art, right? Um, I went to school, um, you know, in high school, I became somewhat disillusioned with comic book fandom and somewhat disappointed in comic books. And I first went to college for, um, I went to film school. Um, and was not very happy there and did not function very well there and dropped out of school. And um, then uh, when Peter came to New York and he started getting work as an assistant to various illustrators, had one or two short pieces published in heavy metal, uh, was inking at Richie Rich. I was like, oh yeah, I remember I used to draw comics. You can make a living doing this, hell yeah. And so then I went to art school <coughs> part-time um, while doing other jobs and, you know, uh, started to sell my work to various magazines and pursued a career in comics. Uh, do you want to mention the name of the art school? Um, I went to Pratt Institute part-time, but I never finished a degree there. I don't have a degree from a college, but I teach at a college. Uh, can you tell me what your what your time at Pratt was like? Were you taking mostly fine arts classes? I got a lot out of the foundation drawing and painting courses, which taught, you know, very basic, you know, Renaissance art techniques. Um, <clears throat> I got a lot out of the anatomy courses. But eventually, um, as time went on, I found I was very much in conflict with the more advanced courses where um, there was a kind of dogmatic um, loyalty to post-World War II notions of abstract art and that you know, art could not be representational, art could not be narrative, uh, comics were not art. Um, you know, and I always found myself saying, well, if that isn't art, what exactly is it? You know, if it's not under the category of art, what category do you place it under? Because it clearly exists, you know? Um, but, um, you know, so I, I wound up, you know, not finishing school, uh, partly because of that, um, you know, and, and partly because it was getting a bit long anyway. And I was starting to work, so it was just go out and do the work, you know. Um, I was getting work published in a number of small papers like the New York Rocker, the East Village Eye, a couple pieces in heavy metal. And I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. You know, and eventually was had illustrations in the New York Times and the Village Voice. So I said, okay, this is what I want to do. What's the point of being in school? But and also because um 
the people in the school had this opposition to what we were doing, um, which was interesting because, you know, the actual art world, the New York art world of the 1980s and the Lower East Side was actually very supportive of a lot of things we were doing. Um, I mean, this was the period when, you know, graffiti art was being recognized when, you know, Keith Haring and David Monrovich and Jean-Michel Bascot was, you know, painting all over the sidewalks here. And we were doing that too. Um, and we were part of that. And there was no problem in the actual, among actual practicing artists about what we were doing. In fact, a lot of them were very interested in comics and were very interested in, you know, the narrative material we brought in, but the art academies were hostile to it. So it was better to just go out into the world. So this fact, is something. Yeah, the art critic Lucy Lepard was very supportive of our work because she was very interested in the idea of that art could address politics. So this is something that's actually come up a few times on this podcast. Uh, creators who went to school with an idea that they wanted to do comics, uh, have comics as a career, who met with a lot of resistance uh, in um, at, at these art institutions. As somebody who's now teaching it at, at SVA, do you know why that was? Like why there was such uh, pushback against comics as a medium? Well, I think that... Um... There are a couple things. Um, one was the post-World War II definitions of modern art uh, were very exclusionary. Um, you know, like early modernism was very adventurous. Um, you know, um, cubism was about seeing things from multiple angles at the same time. Futurism was about seeing things in time. Uh, surrealism was about including your dreams and your art. Um, Dada was about, um, you know, including randomness and accident in your art. These were all very positive notions, but the post-World War II interpretation of modern art, um, saying that art is abstract and non-figurative just says it doesn't have any narrative content. It doesn't say what it is. Right, saying that art is conceptual just means that you're getting rid of the physical object. It doesn't say what you are doing, right? So that there was a very kind of narrowing and exclusivity of the fine art world in the post-World War II period. And that um, meant that people were against any narrative content in art. And so of course against comics. I also think at the same time, um, American culture has always been suspicious or American society has always been suspicious of its own cultural product when it was popular, whether it was jazz music or rock music or comic books or later video games, that there were moral panics associated with all these art forms because there was the sense that the people were getting out of control. And so there were a lot of negatives thrown at us. Um, you know, and it's important to realize that um, particularly, you know, in the 20th century, all the way up until maybe the 80s, um, there was a very exclusive notion of culture. I mean, I can remember having music instructors in grade school who said, we're going to talk about music today, and we don't mean the Beatles. The Beatles aren't music. Now, I can't imagine anyone today saying the Beatles aren't music, but that was a common thing to say in the 1960s and 70s, that the Beatles aren't music. So the Beatles aren't music, comics aren't art, um, you know, representational art is only art if it was done in the 19th century or before starting in the 20th century, we don't count it as art. You know, there was a lot of gatekeeping that was part of the culture then. And today, because of the internet and because of a lot of other things, we don't have as much gatekeeping. I mean, 
you go to the Museum of Modern Art, there's a helicopter hanging there. And they say, yeah, that's art too, that's design. So people have a much broader and more open conception of what art can be than they used to have. So you mentioned the graffiti uh, and street art and protest art of the Lower East Side. Did that have a big influence on you? Um, well, I was part of it. Um, we were putting stuff up on, you know, the walls of the city all the time. Uh, my first, um, my first uh, street corner stencil was a stencil about the U.S. invasion of Grenada. Um, I felt that, you know, the United States picked a war with the smallest socialist country they could find because they wanted to be sure they would win it and they would demonstrate to the American people that it's safe to have a war again. So they <coughs> found the tiny island of Grenada and invaded it. Um, and um, I wanted to protest that. Um, and so I felt if the US can engage in this illegal invasion of a small country, I can invade the walls of New York City. And I cut out a stencil that said, stop the invasions with a woman standing in front of a tank. And um, I sprayed that all over lower Manhattan. I did it pretty much by myself. I had no lookouts. I had no experience doing it and I had no experience with stencils. So the stencil I made was pretty badly constructed and by the morning it was falling apart and I was covered with paint, but I'd gotten away with it. And uh, over the next you know, weeks of people were seeing that stencil and I started thinking about doing street art. Um, and then I created a series of stencils uh, that were like a comic strip that they, they could be read in sequence or they could be read individually. And that was, um, you know, this critter, uh, you don't have to fuck people over to survive was one of those stencils. And there was also a color version, black and white version. Um, so, um, you know, I was influenced by a lot of people who were doing street art. Um, there was a cat named Michael Roman who did uh, Mexican style Calaveras. He was Mexican, but he lived in New York and he was a punk rocker and he would do Calaveras all over the streets of the Lower East Side. And those were very impressive. There was a older guy um, named Anton Van Dalen, who had been one of the few teachers at the art school who was supportive of our magazine. Um, and he had a very kind of precise Dutch stencil style that, you know, where he used, you know, white lines breaking up the black areas to hold the board together so it didn't fall apart. And I learned a lot from that about how to construct a stencil. Um, and of course, David Wanrovich was doing stencils all over lower Manhattan. And we were all very impressed with Wanrovich's work at that time. So all of that influenced me a lot. Um, I was also very affected by um, street artists like Richard Hamilton, who painted these black silhouette figures uh, that, you know, if you walked out at night, you would think there was a person standing there all over lower Manhattan. And Keith Haring, who would do these sort of very simple faceless figures on the subways. And I became very interested in the idea of um, the universal figure of the human being, basically the stick figure, maybe a little more developed than the stick figure, um, an image of a person that stood for all people um, rather than an individual person um, with a, you know, a racial identity, a gender identity, uh, you know, um, a kind of universal figure. And I did a lot of work with that universal figure, particularly in the eighties. And um, that's probably my most popular work is the work that pursued that direction. Later on, I became a lot more interested in individual people uh, because I'd had some life experience 
as an activist and I wanted to talk about how individual personalities interact in political context. So the focus of my work shifted. Um, and I've always felt that um, you shouldn't try to do the same piece over and over again. It's one of the sort of vices of the fine art world that they get people to, art dealers get people to essentially draw the same picture for their entire life because they feel that's easier to market. I don't think that's sincere. I think you should do art based on what your experience is and your experience over the course of your life will change. So I moved in another direction after that. Um, we did street art in the 80s and 90s. And in mid 90s, um, Rudy Giuliani became mayor in New York and it became very dangerous to do street art. Um, you know, you could spend a night in jail um, just for putting up a little sticker, you know? And so it, for me, and I think for a lot of people I know, we started to feel like, well, okay, if you're gonna get arrested, you should do more than a little sticker, you know? Cause um, it's just not worth it. So I continue to do civil disobedience and other types of activism, but I didn't do so much street art anymore. Um, I do admire, um, Shepard Ferry and Banksy for their persistence in the 90s of doing street art. There were people who came to street art late in the game, but um, they persisted in a period where it was getting very dangerous to do it. Um, and um, that's part of why their work is so well known now. Um, they also took advantage of the internet where like, most people see Banksy's work not on a wall, but on a website, you know, so the piece might be destroyed immediately, but it might go all over the world as a digital photo. Um, so that's a different ap approach to street art than we had in the 80s, where what you really wanted was to saturate an area to the point where everybody became familiar with your work because they saw it on every street corner. And that was that was the purpose of it. Um, it became harder to do that as there was more policing of street art. So the work that you were doing for uh, the alt weeklies, I believe you mentioned the East Village Other? Uh, no, the East Village I. The East Village Other was gone by the time Pete and I were in New York. The East Village Other is a paper from the 60s and a little bit the 70s. By the time we were here, there was no East Village Other. I uh, worked for the East Village I, um, which was a magazine that came out of the end of the punk scene and the beginning of the East Village art scene. Um, and I also worked for the New York Rocker, which also came out of the punk scene. Um, those were the first uh, jobs I got. Um, at the time you were working uh, for these alt weeklies, had you already arrived at a style that you were comfortable with? No. Um, I really um, did not arrive at a style I was comfortable with until about the third issue of World War III Illustrated. Um, the first two issues of World War III Illustrated, I was very much affected by, you know, science fiction art. I mean, look, here's a cover of World War III number two, and I've got making a political comment that I'm using two dinosaurs back in Europe. You know, um, that wasn't what I ended up with. What I ended up with was something more affected by street art, more affected by the environment around me. Um, and it was really in the third and fourth issue of World War III Illustrated where I arrived at the style most people know of my work for, um, you know, um, stuff like this, you know, that's simpler, bolder, um, more iconic, um, you know, and that was, that was the direction I went. Um, and, um, so yeah, I think having my own magazine or our own magazine in which I could try different things really helped my style to 
development. Now, for the work that you were doing for World War III and the, uh, the illustrations that you just uh, showed me, were you using stencils and uh, spray paint as well for those? Um, I used a lot of different materials. I did some work with collage and then some work with st spray paint stencils. And uh, the spray paint stencils really helped um, me become a lot more decisive about how I drew. You know, stuff is either going to be black or white, positive or negative. You're cutting a hole in a piece of paper. You can't uncut it. You know, having a limitation like that really improves your work. I think, you know, the big danger of digital media is it's too malleable and you never make good decisions because you can make a decision and unmake a decision. You know, whereas something like a stencil, you got to make a really clear decision about what you're doing. Um, so I developed those materials. Um, and then I also, you know, um, towards the end of the 1980s, developed an inking style I liked, which was very simple and blocky looking and looked a lot like woodcuts, even though I, did, I don't do woodcuts or linoleum cuts, you know, um, but a lot of it looks like that because it has that, you know, heavy blacks and whites and clear break breakup of space. I tend, you know, I tend to alter my style a lot. Um, like you do a comic strip, you know, it could be 10, 20, 30, or a hundred pages. So you got to draw a hundred pages fairly consistently. When you've done that, I don't want to use the same materials on the next project. I want to try something else. And so I've used a lot of different materials and I choose those materials based on the subject material. I say, does this story need grays? Does this story need to be flat black and white? Does this story work with stick figures or does it need a more realistic style of drawing? So each piece I work on, I you know, choose my materials based on the concept of that piece. So I think uh, uh, we should have a discussion of, uh, of the book you did, Len, which has a number of different media. But before we get there, I, uh, I do have a question about the stencil work you're using, at least as far as your illustration work. Were you using like the usual bristle bristleboard or artboard to create your stencils? Um, I was making... My early stencils were all uh, cut out of um, out of poster board. Um, there's no point in getting real valuable materials for stencils because the paint will destroy it anyway, you know. But I cut them out of um, out of um, out of poster board, cheap poster board, and then later on, many years later, I discovered that. Uh, mylar is a very easy material to make stencils out of. It's only a little more expensive and um, it's very easy to cut. So I use uh, frosted mylar uh, now when I do stencils. Um, you know, it's not that much more durable in the long run than the, um, than the oak tag because it's, the, you know, spray paint um, deteriorates a surface anyway. Um, nowadays, I'm making some stencil prints for um, archival purposes and gallery purposes. So instead of using spray paint, I'm using acrylic paint and an airbrush um, and, and airbrush paints, um, which are archival. Um, and uh, have kind of the opposite problem of spray paint. Spray paint goes on too fast and you have to be very careful about applying it or it gets too dark or gets too wet. Whereas um, airbrush kind of goes on too slow and you've got to do several coats before you get a solid. Um, so I've been experimenting with that so that I can make archival prints and also because it's not really healthy to be around too much spray paint. Um, it's bad for you. 
and I'm an older guy and I got to look out for my health now. Um, and I'm not doing that much street work, frankly. You know, uh, spray paint is very good for working on the street. You can work very fast. You know, that's its real virtue is that you can put paint on really fast in the spray can. Now, for the work that you were doing in ink, were you approaching the page, specifically your comics work, were you approaching the page in the traditional comic manner, you know, pencils or blue line pencil on a board and then going over it in Indian ink with a brush? Um, I, okay, I generally start by doing a rough at 50% of published size and then I blow it up. Um, I used to blow it up with a grid or, or blow it up by eye. Now I blow it up with a photocopier and light box it onto whatever paper I'm using. And then I work in pencil and I may ink that, or if I'm using other material, I may paint that, you know, but um, I don't use blue line and I don't use um, standard comic book um, blue sheets. Um, you know, I've, rarely worked for the mainstream comics um you know I, I i colored one story for superboy when i was in my 20s they didn't like it so i didn't continue um i don't usually use the comics. sorry out of out of curiosity why didn't they like it do you know i don't know i don't know i i, I think that i misunderstood some of their ideas about what colors they wanted it was a miscommunication and I was just looking for work. So I, I didn't, I didn't stick with them. Um, I did a number of pieces for heavy metal uh, when I was in my twenties, um, including a quite lengthy 30 page piece that later was in war in the neighborhood that appeared in heavy metal magazine. Um, but that's not the same. I've rarely used that tall, narrow comic book format that, are in the standard Marvel blue line sheets. I've rarely used it. Um, I like nowadays a uh, seven by nine page that people call a standard trade paperback format. Uh, so most of my books published in the US are seven by nine. Um, in Europe, they like to print my work larger. So they take the same work that's printed in seven by nine and they print great big hardcover books of it in France. Um, that always confused me because I never intended it to be that big, but they like it that way. So what the hell? Uh, the originals are that size. I like some reduction. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, I did very, very large originals because we had stat cameras and you could, you know, have an original that was like, you know, yay big, right? And shoot it down to get an eight half by 11 page. Now that we use scanners, the scanners usually don't run larger than 11 by 17. Um, and it's pretty hard to get a large piece of artwork scanned. So for a number of artists I know uh, who were active in the 70s and 80s, that technological transition was difficult, um, that we all had to work smaller to facilitate the use of the scanners. Like a piece like that painting back there, you can't put on a scanner, it's too big, you know? Um, so, you know, my materials shifted to deal with the publishing technologies I had to deal with. As far as your brush work, do you have a, a set of brushes that you like or a type of brush that you like? Um, I generally use very small brushes. I don't use nibs, you know? Um, I, particular I reason? I don't like the nib pen. Even for my lines, I use a like a zero or a triple zero brush uh, for my line work that's going to be inked. Uh, as far as your roughs go, how detailed are your roughs? Very detailed. Um, perhaps obsessively. Sometimes my roughs look better than my finishes. Um, one comic strip I did was actually all roughs um yeah um this one here um was a 
comic strip I did about um, the is about the Israel-Palestine conflict, and I painted them about this big, you know, and I made very detailed little paintings. And I said, you know what? I don't need to repaint this. I'll just scan it at you know um, 1,200 DPI and blow it up and then put the lettering into the larger version and it worked fine. They looked very impressionistic and very rough and it got the texture of the paper, the tooth of the paper shows in it and it looks good, you know? So a lot of my roughs, you know, are very, very tight. Um, you know, um, and I'm not sure why I do that. It's probably a terrible idea, you know, because I'm redoing the same drawing. Um, but it's just how my mind works that, you know, I want a lot of control of what I'm doing. I, um, want to figure it out, you know, so my roughs are very tight. Now, a lot of your work, like war in the neighborhood, understanding the crash, Len deal with, uh, real people, real places. Uh, do you use a lot of photo reference in your work? Um, as years have gone by, I've used more. Um, when I started out, um, I didn't like doing political caricature because I felt like I've never actually met Ronnie Reagan. And so all I'm doing is looking at photos of him and trying to figure out how to draw him. So I actually, in some of my early work, I would just Xerox a photo of Ronnie Reagan and paste him onto a figure. Because I said, look, I've never met the guy. Why should I pretend I know how to draw him? Um, then when I started working on War in the Neighborhood, um, I became very aware that there were people, individual people who had a big impact on what was going on in the world. And I developed every form of reference I could. I would sit with my friends and do, you know, multiple life drawings of them in different positions. Then I would also get, I knew a lot of the photographers who were part of the Lower East Side political scene, you know, cause we all, we all knew each other, you know? And I would say, hey, can I get a look at your contact sheet from the demonstration yesterday? And so I would acquire it you know, piles and piles of photo reference. So I used both life drawing and photo reference to try to develop um, as clear a take on what something looked like as possible to augment my own memory of events that I was part of. Then later when I was doing the Len Weinglass book, of course, I'm dealing with things that happened in the 60s and 70s when I was, you know, a, grade school student and I never met any of these people. I think I met Abby Hoffman once in my life, um, shortly before he died actually. I never met Leonard Weinglass. I had to construct these people from the photos that existed, from the films that existed. So then I became very dependent on all that reference. And so then you have to get enough of that reference that you are not um, imprisoned by your references, you know, that, you know, I've got a picture of this guy in every imaginable position. And then I'm able to extrapolate from that what he would look like in a third position. I've got him this way and this way. And then I got to come up with how he looks this way. So, you know, there's a lot of work involved in that. Um, right now I'm working on a comic strip about my mother's childhood. And a big part of my mother's childhood was this candy store that um, she worked in and lived in. The family lived in and worked in a small business. They were very much like the immigrant families that run like what we would call Korean fruit stand now, but they were Jewish immigrants who lived in and worked in their store. And I've heard many stories about this candy store, but it was gone by the time I was here on this earth. And I don't have any photos of it. And I spent a lot of time with my uncle Phil, who's the last surviving candy store kid um, and doing multiple sketches of it 
And okay, was the door here? Was the door here? You know, what type of windows did it have? What type of display did it have? You know, where were the chairs and tables arranged inside? Where was the deli counter? You know, and I made sketches and sketches until he started saying, yeah, that's what it looks like. And that's the way I've developed that. So each project has different demands on you. You know, I don't have photos of that candy store. I can't work from photo reference. I have some photos of my mom when she was a kid, but I don't have extensive photos. So I have to, you know, look at that and imagine what would she look like from all these different angles. Um, so when you're recreating something from real life, you know, you have an obligation to try to grasp what it looked like, you know, but then you also, you, you know, you have the right to take some liberties with it too. You know, um, hopefully you find a very good source for photos. Um, I did a comic strip about the IWW for this anthology Wobblies. And I was very fortunate that the actual uh, factories that the 1912 Bread and Roses strike took place and that those buildings still exist, um, although they're shut down. I was able to go to Lawrence, Massachusetts and sketch those. And that there is a museum there that shows what the inside of the mills was like. And there are several books that collect the photos. So I was able to work with all of that and assemble it. And again, there is a certain amount there's a certain point when you are interpreting it, you know, you can't help that. Um, there's like a push and pull between um, what really happened and what will make a good comic strip and what will make a meaningful comic strip to an audience, you know, and you as the artist negotiate where that is, you know, and each artist will do that differently. Um, you know, so, you know, you have, um, you have references, you have real documentation, but you also have interpretation. The two things happen at the same time. I'd like to talk about your, your writing process a little bit. Do you have a, do you have a preference for how you, how you approach writing? Do you start with an outline, move on to a script before you start drawing? Nowadays, I use an outline. Um, nowadays, I write into a computer. I, of course, used to write onto a pad of paper. Um, I do multiple drafts, usually making them shorter. Usually, when I start writing, everything just kind of comes out in a pile of stuff. And then I'm like, okay, what's really important here? And I, I, I write down. I simplify what I write. And then when I take that script and I turn it into a storyboard, it becomes more simple because how many, how many words can you fit on this page? And in a lot of ways, the comic book medium makes you write less and you'll start to notice, okay, I described this part in words and the picture's there and it doesn't need the words. And on top of it, the words are cluttering up the physical space of the artwork. So you cut down your writing. Um, and then you'll realize certain things, you know, and I realized this more as I got older, certain things don't want to be illustrated. You know, um, you know, certain things are expressed better in words than in pictures. Um, and you have to figure out which things those are. You know, um, and you know what's the economical use of words and pictures, where the pictures are doing what pictures do best, and the words are doing what words do best. And how do you find that balance? How do you decide what is better expressed in text and what is better better expressed uh, as a visual? For me, it's still a lot of trial and error. You know, I mean. I'm constantly finding out new things as I work. So I'll try something, it doesn't work, I change it and then, okay, now it works, you know? Um, I used to try to make everything 
visual so that, you know, if somebody, um, if somebody is thinking of going to Nebraska, they have a thought balloon with a picture of Nebraska in their head. And at a certain point I was like, you know, that's stupid. You know, I'm drawing something that doesn't need to be there. You know, he can just say, I'm thinking of going to Nebraska. It's okay, you know, and it just became simpler, you know, um, but you have to, you have to try and see what works, you know, um, you know, we, words are a part of our lives. We do think in words, we do use words, you know, so doing an, a 100% silent comic is actually an affectation. Um, words always exist for people, you know, um, try to stop thinking in words and see if you can do it for 10 minutes. You know, words are part of your life. So words are part of my comics. So you did a, a wordless comic that I think we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, before we get there though, uh, do you do your own lettering? Do you do your own lettering yeah. by hand? And you know, the few times I've used digital lettering, my readers and my friends objected. I actually thought the digital lettering looked pretty good, but people were like, no, I can't stand that. I want your hand letter. So I've gotten, you know, I, as a kid, um, people thought my handwriting was awful and my spelling was worse. You know, my mother used to physically abuse me over spelling. It, she, it freaked her out that I couldn't spell very well. And my hand lettering was really cramped and didn't look very good. And over time, I've developed a handwriting style that's fairly distinctive and people like. Um, and so now, you know, people want that hand lettering style. And so I use it, you know. Um, like I say, I've done a few pieces with digital lettering and I actually thought it was interesting what you can do with digital lettering, the way you can free transform it and warp it. And, you know, there's some cool stuff you can do with digital lettering, but the people who read my work have said they prefer the hand lettering. So I do that. For understanding the crash, you worked with other writers. Is that correct? Um, I worked with Doug Henwood. And my initial plan was to work with Doug Henwood because he is sort of the go-to guy on the left for economics. And he did one chapter with me and he got me a lot of good source. I mean, okay, understanding the crash was a response to the uh, financial crash um, of, um, you know, both the crash in the value of housings and the way that crashed the banks and the, you know, kind of weird forms of credit that led to that crash. And so I needed somebody who had some really good knowledge of economics as a discipline to back me up in that. You know, I had, my, my aunt was a lawyer for a number of homeowners who were in foreclosure in the city of Cleveland. And she took me around to show me the neighborhoods where everything was boarded up and introduced me to people who were losing their homes in foreclosure and to lawyers who were fighting for them. And um, so I had that anecdotal experience, but I needed a basis in economic theory and, you know, what the hell is, um, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, what, what the hell are all these different types of credit and different types of mortgage and, you know, mortgage backed security, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I needed somebody who could explain that to me. And the first person I hit on for that was Doug Henwood, um, who's the go-to guy on the left for economic theory. And he's a brilliant guy. And um, <clears throat> he worked on one chapter with me, which I really liked. And we had a literary agent who was shopping it around. And then Doug Henwood's wife got pregnant and he felt he didn't have time to work on it. He dropped out of it. <laughs> and so I got Eric Larson, who is um, a very wonky, serious journalist who's written a number of books 
and who's written a lot of economics columns. So I thought he would be good at <clears throat> helping sort out that material and he worked with me on the rest of it. Um, so it was sort of my job to take all these terms from the world of Wall Street and turn them into images that people could understand and very simple explanations of them that anyone could follow. Um, it, I perhaps erred in the direction of clarity and people said it feels a bit remedial, but um, <clears throat> I, think, I think that's good because I think that it shouldn't only be, you know, elite people with, um, you know, business degrees and law degrees who understand what Wall Street does because Wall Street is affecting all of us. So we should all understand what these securities are and how they affected our economy. So I tried to make it as clear as possible. Um, and I think I succeeded in that regard. Um, so, you know, that was a book which may have informed some of the activism that was part of Occupy Wall Street, I don't know, but it was put out a couple of years before Occupy Wall Street and it really dealt with the anatomy of the financial crash. So understanding the crash is, is interesting to me, just in the way, uh, you know, comics is, is often compared to other visual media like film and television and understanding the crash in terms of subject matter overlaps with a movie like The Big Short, which deals with a lot of the same issues. Uh, you yourself, I believe you said you, you were studying film or you went to school for film for a little bit? I went to school for film a long time ago. Oh, you know, I, I I wouldn't say I'm a filmmaker anyway. But but I think you understand uh, what I'm getting at in terms of the way a filmmaker might approach the subject uh, versus a, a comics creator. Um, in understanding the crash, you know these these predatory lenders and some of the financial institutions are represented as sharks, as barracudas. You know, sometimes law enforcement in your comics is. Uh, is represented as as pigs, um, and it's it's a it's a very strong visual shorthand uh, to let the reader know the character of uh, the um, the people being being represented. Um, and, and, and I draw those images from the movements I'm working with. Um, there was an organization in Cleveland that, when they held protests at banks, they would throw plastic sharks at the bankers. You know, they chose the loan shark as their image. So I said, okay, if that's good enough for the people in foreclosure, it's good enough for me to use as a metaphor. It's a commonly understood image. Um, to refer to police as pigs has been part of protest movements in the United States since the 1960s. Um, and it's an insult. Um, but it's an insult with a tradition. It's an insult that relates to how a lot of people feel. And so my decision to choose that as an image was because it came out of the masses of people and what they wanted to say and how they felt. Um, so, you know, I allowed um, the populace to be, to have a role in my authorship that I spoke for, I tried to speak for them and represent how they felt. Um, the use of animals as metaphors for negative human behaviors goes back to um, the 18th and 19th century, to Francisco Goya, uh, to Thomas Nass. Um, and it's always fun to do because, you know, you get to draw animals, which is in itself a fun thing to do, like examine animal anatomy compared to human anatomy um, and come up with these various mutations that's fun to draw. But I choose my metaphors um, as things that represent the way people are feeling and what people are saying and that people will understand immediately. I'm very concerned, particularly in my more political work, with clarity, with understanding, with, you know, everybody should see this and get the message. 
And I think that's one of the benefits of, of comics as a medium that you can you can use this, this symbolic imagery that has long cultural connotations. You know, arts people have been using cats and mice and, and mouse. Uh, you know, people immediately understand the analogy and people immediately understand uh, what, what the connotations of that would be. Um, and if you contrast that with a film like The Big Short, you know, uh, it, you know, fair enough. Adam McKay comes from a, a sketch comedy and, you know, absurdist comedy background. And so his sensibilities are very different, but, you know, in, in trying to explain these very difficult um, happenings and, and financial systems, you know, you end up with like uh, uh, the chef, I can't remember his name right now, Bourdain, Anthony Bourdain, you know, uh, cutting up, pieces of old fish and putting them in a stew. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a different way of, of explaining a very complicated thing. And I think when comparing comics to other media, you know, one of the ways in which comics, um, comics translates easier to other languages and other cultures is these very simple, um, stylistic choices, you know, sharks, barracudas, leeches, the FBI as, you know, these giant eyeballs following people around, things like that. Well, you know, I wasn't aware of this work until fairly recently. Um, but during the Russian Revolution, there's a whole um, body of stenciled poster works that were essentially comic strips. They were like multiple posters and sequence um, that were produced with uh, painted stencils um, that explain a political situation very much step by step, very simply with simple figures and simple phrases. Um, and um, it actually looks a lot like some of the work that, you know, stencil artists like myself or Eva Cockroft did in the 1980s. Um, so that the idea of, you know, drawings as a way of simplifying or generalizing human uh, experience has existed for a long time. Um, and it also goes along with, you know, the idea of, you know, an iconic stick figure that stands for everyone, the ability to draw groups of people as figures um, these are all things that make comics a very good medium for explaining political ideas. So I'd like to talk about the book Len that you did. Can you explain uh, just briefly, briefly who Len Weinglass was and why you were attracted to him as a subject? Sure. Leonard Weinglass was... Um, probably one of the greatest criminal defense attorneys of his time. Um, he represented a lot of um, political activists who were on trial. He represented the Chicago Seven. He represented um, Angela Davis. He represented Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, he represented Daniel Ellsberg. Um, and he was, um, known for getting his clients off, frankly. Uh, he was good. Um, he tended to be eclipsed by more showy figures such as his sometimes law partner, um, William Kunstler, who was much more performative. But if you looked at the actual case law, you would find that it was Leonard who resulted in those legal victories that allowed his clients to go home rather than go to prison. And at the point when Leonard died, a lot of people lamented the fact that there was never a book about Leonard Weinglass. There was nothing, you know, that Leonard had sort of avoided personal publicity. He was a very private man. And his friends wanted there to be a book about Leonard and they hired me to do a graphic novel about uh, Lenny Weinglass, which because it was inspired by his friends, I used his first name, Len, because they always called him Len. He was a very likable person. And, um, you know, I, 
um, had access to members of Leonard's family who had photographs of him to friends of his, um, to some defendants. Um, working on different cases was very different. For instance, the Chicago 7 case, there are more books about the Chicago 7 case than you could ever read. You know, and in fact, you know, Abby Hoffman, one of the defendants has written a number of books about the trial in which he contradicts himself because what he wrote about the trial 20 years later is not what he wrote about the trial at the time. You know, Tom Hayden, the same thing, another defendant. Um, so there's a vast literature about the Chicago 7 trial. Whereas some of the cases he did in the 1980s, there's almost no documentation. I had to go and find the defendants and interview the defendants and produce my own body of information about those cases. Um, so each chapter was kind of different. Um, but I found Leonard a very compelling figure because of his deep emotional commitment to his clients. He really cared about them as people. He was trying to protect them. You know, he was a very loving human being. Um, in fact, um, I found one video interview um, where he breaks down in tears because he's so happy that one of his defendants um, went home and was able to have a whole life. I was exonerated and, you know, had a marriage and a life and a family all after having been in danger of being convicted and executed, you know? Um, so I felt that Leonard was a very compelling and interesting man and one who hadn't uh, received the attention he deserved. And so I did a book about him um, at the behest of friends of his who wanted a, such a book done. So earlier in our conversation, we talked about how you never wanted to stick with a single style or a single medium. Uh, throughout Len, you actually used uh, different media for the different uh, chapters, including brush and ink. I believe one chapter is in Scratchboard. Yes, it's in Clayboard, actually. And, um, and uh, there seem to be a few chapters that are done in either charcoal or soft pencil. They were done in pencil and wash. And then others that were done in, uh, you know, flat black ink with an inker. Um, and, you know, those were because different parts of the story needed a different approach. And, you know, if you have, you know, a 30 page story in, you know, pencil and wash, you know, I think you're ready to look at another 30 page story in another medium. And um, I found that worked for me. Now, were there narrative elements that also led to your decision to choose the wash or the, uh, the scratch board or whatever? Sure. Um, I probably put more love into the chapter on um, Jimmy Simmons than any other chapter. Uh, and I used the clay board for that. That was partly because um, I did an extensive interview with Karen Simmons, Jimmy Simmons' wife, and she described things so beautifully. And I felt, well, I really need Scratchboard to describe this. I need that level of detail. Um, other chapters um, seemed like they needed a cleaner and more economical style. Um, I felt the chapter on Ellsberg um, a lot of what I had was photo documentation that had a lot of gray tone in it. And I felt I, the best way to work from that photo documentation was to bring that grayscale element into the artwork. So each chapter I approached somewhat differently. Sorry, real quick. Uh, what's the difference between scratchboard and clayboard? A uh, clay board is um, a heavy masonite board with a porcelain surface. It's, a, it's more expensive. Um, it's more solid. Um, I think I switched to clay board when good quality scratch boards stopped being made and sold in 
you know, art supply stores in the New York area. And then I found that clayboard um, was a really nice medium. These pieces on the wall back here are all in cradled clayboard and they hang really nicely and it makes a really nice solid piece of artwork. Um, and I've experimented actually, even though, you know, both scratchboard and clayboard were initially a printmaker's sketch medium. So they sort of Im imitate the surface of a woodcut or a linoleum cut while being more workable because you can, you know, put the black in, cut it out and put it back in and then cut it out a number of times, which you can't do with a linoleum cut. You make a cut and you're finished, right? But I decided I like that surface and I've even done some pieces um, where I've done wash work and gray work and painting on clayboard. And I find that comes out interesting ways too. So I've experimented with different ways of using clayboard, which I think is an interesting medium. Do you use etching tools when you work with the clayboard? Um, I use, um, yeah, I cut it. I cut the surface. Do you use like an X-Acto knife or something like that? Not an X-Acto knife. I use um, like a, you know, what do you call it? Um, a scratch board tool with like a, a blade and you cut away the black or you cut away the gray and you make a white line through that. Okay. Uh, so for most of your career, except for the, uh, the Superboy story that you mentioned, uh, you haven't touched superheroes very much, but in Len, there is a, a very Marvel comic superhero kind of moment. Do you want to talk yeah. about that? Well, I had fun with it. You know, um, you know, Leonard's greatest, one of Leonard's greatest achievements was the victory in the Chicago seven case. Um, and the victory, like most people don't, there are people who don't realize that this, the, Chicago seven got off because in the first trial they were convicted. Um, they had a very biased judge who ran a kangaroo court and got them all convicted or most of them. Um, but Leonard was able to make an appeal to a higher court and show that this judge was biased and a little bit out of his mind and get the whole thing thrown out. And I read through the transcript of um, Leonard's case, um, which, I mean, it was that thick. It was like, I used the tr both the transcripts of the original trial, which are quite colorful, because it was very interesting testimony. And then the transcript of the appeal, which was as long as the transcript of the trial. And what I found about the transcript of the appeal was that it was quite dull and that an audience there was a lot of technical points about the way the judge had manipulated evidence. And I felt an audience would not want to sit through that having already sat through the whole trial. And I said, okay, how do I, you know, give this a kind of energy that would be attractive? And I said, well, okay, maybe here's the place where I can use the superhero joke and I can use, you know, my background as a, Jack Kirby fan to my advantage, you know? And so rather than um, showing the minutia of the appeals process, I showed Leonard as a superhero overturning the bad verdict against the Chicago seven. And that was a good shorthand for that event and a way of showing how dramatic it was and how important it was. Because I think one of the main reasons that you know, Kunstler's failed defense of the Chicago Seven is the subject of so much film and so much literature. And Wineglass's successful defense of the Chicago Seven is not even known about, is it's just not very interesting to look at. You know, it's boring, right? So how do I make it interesting? And I'm like, okay, you know, Comics are nothing if not interesting. The tradition of comics is full of exaggeration and hyperbole. So what kind of hyperbole can I use to build up Leonard in this scene? And I felt that worked very well. Uh, I only kind of put this together uh, 
just now uh, speaking with you, but you know, I, I also grew up on a lot of those early Marvel comics, and there were very they were very black and white in terms of their depiction of justice and truth and superheroes being these kind of um, selfless, almost uh, self-martyring figures. And it, it only dawned on me that a lot of my interest in, you know, social reform and, and various justice movements may have been shaped by a lot of those early comics, you know, especially the, you know, the Kirby comics like Kirby, you know, you know, I, I guess well, the. I mean, were they so black and white? I mean, the Incredible Hulk is very destructive, but he's very angry because he's he's oppressed. You know? and, and that's exactly right. And you know, it, if Hulk, if the Hulk was, especially in those Kirby years, rebelling against anything, it was you know various forms of oppression and antagonism. And the military, it has to be pointed out, was maybe his <laughs> his most regular foe during those early comics. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know if you have any insight to that or whether you believe that. I think that, you know, the attraction to Marvel Comics when we were kids was very much... And look, most art appeals to the fact that we don't like being oppressed. Most of it. You know, if you look through the history of art, um, art is all very radical. Entertainment is all very radical. Nobody wants to be told that they should be oppressed. Well, nobody does. You know, so in, you know, your hours off work, your hours off school, the thing you choose to read, the thing you choose to look at is something that tells you, hey, you're okay, you know? So yeah, that's in the Marvel comics, you know. Um, but I could also argue that's in the Jewish and Christian and Muslim gospels too, you know. Um, art is about the fact that we want better. We want to live better. We don't. We don't want to, you know, keep being oppressed. We want to improve our situation. We all do. So let's talk about some of your most recent work. Can you tell me a little bit about Iconoclasm? Okay, Iconoclasm developed um, because I was doing a presentation at the Museum of Claimed Urban Space and an intern came up who said, I would like to interview you very much the way you're interviewing me about your activism. And this young interview interviewer, this young intern named Maxine she interviewed me. And at the end of the interview, I said, so, okay, what do you do? What activism do you do? And she was like, oh, well, you know, my friends of mine, sometimes we go out at night and we destroy Confederate monuments. And I was like, you what? You destroy Confederate monuments? That sounds a bit risky. Um, she says, well, I do it a little, other people do it more, you know, and I'm like, Maxine, you've got to write this up. And so Maxine and I embarked on doing a series of comics about the movement to destroy Confederate monuments. And so far we've done two installments. Um, the first was published in um, a um, anarchist magazine called... Um, called Upping the Ante, and it was published in an Italian magazine called Scoop. The second has only been published in Italian, um, and both of these are about the movement to pull down the Confederate monuments. The second, which I sent you, and which will be in the next issue of World War III Illustrated, hopefully, um, was based on an interview with a young activist who had been involved in pulling down Confederate monuments in, um, in Raleigh. Um, and um, this activist gave the most beautiful interview I've ever conducted. Um, they, um, like, 
you could have taken every single word, printed it on the page. It would have been a complete, well-edited short story. Okay. This kid was a genius. All right. But then at the end of the interview, they say, I don't want any pictures of myself in this comic strip. I don't want people to know my gender. I don't know, want people to know my race. I don't want people to know anything about me. And I'm like, well, how am I going to do that when every single paragraph is, I did this, I went here, I went there. My friend said this to me. It's me, 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 I, 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 all the way through. It's a first person narrative. And that troubled me for a couple of weeks. And then the debate around the country about masks got really intense. And at that point I was like, well, yeah, of course, everybody's masked. That's easy, right? Everybody in this story will be masked, except George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other people who'd been killed by the police. Their faces we see. And the faces of the protesters are all covered. And that became the mode of that piece. And I feel it became a really strong piece. Um, and I'm really, really happy with how it worked. And I think it also spoke to the younger generation who are kind of troubled by identity, uh, kind of want to be genderless and raceless and anonymous um, in a way that we didn't, you know, that my generation wanted our individuality so badly. You know, we felt that our society was so conformist and we wanted to show everyone what was special about us. And I think some of the younger people feel that they're overwhelmed with all the individuality that society affords middle-class people in America now. You know, that everybody's got a Facebook page where they tell you about yourself and, you know, show you how they look and, and they feel that that's very crass and they, they want kind of a more identity-less or facelessness. Um, and so I felt that that piece spoke to that and I feel, I feel very good about that piece. I think it worked really well. Can you tell me a little bit about The Face of Struggle? Okay. The Face of Struggle. Um, this book. Um, this was an idea that came from my French publisher. Um, they wanted to do, they, they had all just done a French translation of War in the Neighborhood that sold pretty well in France and actually got nominated for the best reprint at Agulum Comic Book Convention. So it did fairly well. Um, and they wanted, they, they were doing a kind of experimental series where they were doing limited edition printings of um, silkscreen comic books, very much the way the uh, old wordless graphic novels by Franz Masuriel or Lynn Ward were woodcut uh, publications. And then once they became popular, they were printed in offset. They were gonna do a series of silkscreen books. They were gonna do like a pressing of 300 copies and then if it was successful, they would go back to print and do it an offset. And they wanted them to be wordless in the tradition of the old wordless books. And they said, we'd like you to do um, a book about the rise of fascism. Um, and we'd like it to be influenced by, um, by Franz Masuriel's The Idea. And in the idea, uh, you have this artist who's sitting at his drawing table and this naked woman pops out of his head and goes running out into the world. And the whole world is offended by the nakedness of this image. And so it's sort of a statement on obscenity and censorship and art. And I was like, okay, 
this doesn't play in um, 2019, you know? Um, you can't just have the female character be a man's fantasy. The female character has to have some authorship and some ideas of her own. Um, but I thought the way female figures have been used as allegories for ideas throughout history, I have actually thought that was kind of interesting. I know that there's a feminist critique of that, but I actually thought it was interesting, you know? And I thought something could be done with that. And so I came up with this wordless graphic novel where there's this um, woman who represents um, rebellion, you know, and represents, you know, the ideas of struggle. And then I kind of played her against a figure who is very similar to Donald Trump. And one of the things that interested me about Trump um, was a photograph I'd seen of him very early on in his campaign for president where he's shouting as his mouth is always shouting, but he's looking over his shoulder at the same time as he's shouting, which, you know, if someone shouts at you, they tend to look at you. They don't look over their shoulder. So it's a gesture which seemed to imply that the shouting was fake, was staged, that his mind was actually elsewhere. And so I got the idea of Trump as a guy wearing a fake scream, a fake face, you know, that he'd put on. And so I got the idea that he, he stole this face, you know, and actually, you know, a, a big deal was made about the fact that um, Trump's wife in her, her his speech to the Republican convention plagiarized Michelle Obama's speech to the Democratic convention. But not much was made of the fact that I found Trump's speeches that were stolen almost line for line from Bernie Sanders' speeches. And that he'd taken those speeches and rewritten them a little bit. And we went from saying, you know, um, you know, um, low wage countries to saying Mexico, you know, but it's pretty much the same thing said by Sanders and said by Trump. Um, he even at one point said that if he were elected president, he would repeal Glass-Steagall, uh, which of course he didn't do. But, you know, I became interested in the idea of Trump as this fake person, you know, this person who'd stolen other people's ideas, um, and also this very violent pathological figure, because a lot of my students really like serial killer stories. I don't like serial killer stories because some people in the Lower East Side were actually killed by serial killers. And so I kind of get revolted by serial killer movies and stuff. But one of the figures they were interested in was this guy who would cut off people's faces with um, a chainsaw and wear their faces. And I thought, okay, uh, what's the worst thing I could compare Trump to? Sure, a guy like that, you know? And so I got the idea that, you know, Trump cuts off the face of rebellion and wears it. And that becomes his identity. And he has this fake screaming face you know, like one of the things that's interesting is like Trump has a very small mouth. He's a big man with a small mouth. Um, and he tries to make his mouth look bigger by going like that, you know. Um, but if you really look at him, he's still got a very small mouth. Trump, if he took better care of himself, would be considered a very handsome man by traditional um, Eurocentric notions of attractiveness. But first of all, he's overweight. And secondly, he deliberately distorts his own face to make himself look angry um, and to make his mouth look bigger and to make his eyes look bigger when he's actually got a small mouth and a large chin. Um, so I thought that was really interesting um, that 
Trump was this man who was trying to look angry and trying to look like he represented the rage of the oppressed when in fact, you know, he's one of the most privileged people in our political life, you know, um, having never had to work a day in his life. Um, so I thought that made him an interesting figure. And I thought I could bring that out with this metaphor of cutting off a face and putting it on, um, which is a fairly violent metaphor. And I understand there's some people who need a trigger warning on this thing because uh, it's a fairly violent comic book. But I thought if you can't do a violent comic book about Donald Trump, you can't do a violent comic book. I mean, you know, um, this is a guy who brags about, you know, the possibility that he could shoot someone, you know. So I, a guy who violates all of the boundaries we normally set for public discourse. So I felt like, yeah, I'll do a really violent comic about Trump and about American fascism. And yeah, so I did that. Um, and um, it first came out in France. Um, and then AK Press picked it up. And one of the ironies of this is it went to press in April. Um, a month after the whole country went into lockdown and I was like, oh man, this book is screwed. I can't go on tour. There are no bookstores open. How will people read this book? And it turned out the online sales of the book were very good and it did quite well. So I was very much heartened by that. Um, and it told me something interesting about the, the way the world of publishing is moving. Um, so that book was my statement on Donald Trump. Uh, one would hope it would have no further relevance because Trump will simply go away. I actually think that's unlikely. I think we're gonna be seeing Trump in the next election if we don't see Trump in prison. Uh, so Trump is gonna be on the American political landscape for a long time. And I think the book will continue to be relevant. In terms of the process of creating art for these silk screens, did you have to approach the page differently than you do your, your usual art? Well, in a way, I mean, I sketched it out at the size it would print because I felt like, you know, I had to be really conscious of the format. You know, and I even sketched it out on more or less the color of paper they were gonna use. It was gonna be two color, I had a lot of trouble convincing them to make the whole thing two color. You know, I wanted it to be three color. I wanted it to be black, red, and blue, you know, seeing as red and blue have become the iconic colors of the American election, right? But they wouldn't do three colors. So, you know, I wanted to be like red fire and blue waves. And they're like, no, can't do it. So, okay, I had black and red to work with on yellow. And so I sketched all that out at pretty much the size it would print. Um, and um, then I actually felt, you know, because I was working, you know, in this mode of, um, you know, the iconic female figure, you know, um, that goes all the way back to like, 19th century female allegories and you know classical painting and such that I wanted the female figure to be rel relatively realistic in her appearance even though Trump is pretty much a cartoon so I got a model for it Louisa Krupp who's one of the um better art models in the New York area and she did the poses and I used both life drawings and photographs to you know, flesh out that figure and give it a very kind of classical feel um, in the middle of this otherwise very flat and iconic comic strip. Um, so that was my process. Um, it was different in some ways, but similar in others. I did start with a sketch that was very simple and then I elaborated that sketch. You mentioned a book that you're working on about your parents 
Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that and when you hope to have that out? I'm not sure. You know, I did a comic strip. We, we, we had a death issue of World War III Illustrated um, about, this must be seven years ago now. Um, and this basically happened because um, Peter Cooper lost his father and I lost my mother the same year. And Peter was like, we should do a death issue. And I was like, okay. And Peter edited it. And we have a rotating editorship at World War III. Um, and I did a piece about my mother's death, end of life process, whatever you want to call it. Um, that, that was a um, pretty strong piece, I thought. Um, and um, when Paul and Dardell, my French publisher, came to New York to look at um, War in the Neighborhood and the possibility of printing that in France, he saw that issue of World War III and he was like, this is the best thing you've ever done. You've got to do this piece. Um, you've got to turn this into a book. And I was like, well, my father is still alive and I didn't feel it was right to do an end of life book about my parents when my father was still alive, you know? And so I put that off. And then around the time that they translated Lynn into French, he's like, when are you gonna do a book about you folks? And at that point, my father had died, um, but Donald Trump was president. And I was like, look, uh, nobody wants to see a book about my family when Donald Trump is president. And let's put this off. And I'm now starting to work on it. Um, I've encountered the usual problem one has with reality-based piece that some people don't like it. My sister does not like the comic strip. And I'm trying to work that out with her. Um, I don't know when it will be done. I'm doing one chapter of it that doesn't involve my sister. That's entirely about my mother's childhood and about my relationship with my mother, which is a very complicated relationship. My mother was a very complicated woman. She had diabetes from the time she was 14. She had fits of mania. Uh, she could be quite abusive to both myself and my sister. On the other hand, she always had good intentions. Um, which of course, if you say that someone has good intentions, that's not always a compliment. It's a complicated thing to say that someone has good intentions. That means they didn't always have good results. Um, so it's a complicated piece and I'm working on it. And uh, Paula Hewitt and Jordan Worley, who were my co-editors on the new issue of World War III, have encouraged me to do it for the next issue of World War III. Hopefully it will wind up in that issue. Again, I'm not 100% sure. You know, um, the issue is forming up and different things are being edited in and out and we'll see if I get it done in time. Um, and I'm, you know, there are a lot of issues with this that need to be resolved. And I really need to think about it. Um, you know, it's a complicated, a very complicated piece. It's not as overtly political as some of the other work I've done. And some people might be disappointed about that. Um, but I feel like everything is political. Everything in your life has a political significance. And certainly our relationships with our families are political. Um, so, We'll see how it works out. In terms of style, do you know more or less what, what kind of uh, art style you wanna wanna use for that, that book? Yes, it will be in, um, in graphite and ink wash on clayboard because the first chapter was done in that style. Uh, the, the one I did for the for World War III Illustrated and uh, it worked really well and I'm going to maintain that style. Although I may decide to have one chapter in color. I may break that style to have one. I have 
very vivid memories of um, an early morning, um, an early morning when I was in, I was pre-K um, and we had it, we drove across country. And so we got up very early in the morning and I rode in the car with my father and I, for the first time in my life, saw a sunrise. And I'd love to do that in full color. But other than that, it will be grayscale, um, clayboard with wash and, you know, scratching out the white areas and stuff like that, um, as the first chapter is. I can stick with one style all the way through, although I'm really tempted to have one chapter in color. Out of curiosity, has some of your recent work been done digitally, either colored digitally or drawn digitally? Well, that's a funny question because when people ask me that, they say, was this digital? Anything that's printed today is digital because you can't go to a printer with a piece of original artwork and say, print this. They won't take it from you. You have to send them a digital file. So even pieces like these that are hanging on the wall, I have to scan them. And then even to get them to look like they look on the wall, I have to tweak them in Photoshop because Photoshop makes everything very gray. And then I have to heighten the contrast for it to look like that. So everything you do for print is digital. Now, how much digital you're going to do, that's a complicated decision. Um, I have found that there are things that work a lot better using digital. For instance, um, I like to have white type on, in my black areas. It's a way of getting more type into a comic strip page without disrupting the artwork. What I used to do was that I would go to a copy shop and I would make a negative printout of that type. I would cut it out and glue it into the artwork. Now I do that with a scanner and I dub that in. Um, the coloring on this book, that coloring was all done digitally, you know? I made a two-tone with, I did black, uh, black and white artwork up by hand, but then the red was put in digitally. Um, you know, so digital enters into all my work now. You know, I'm not, I don't consider myself a digital artist, but you really can't produce art for print without it. So I use it where I can. I use it where it helps my work. So, and, and yeah, I've actually done some pieces where I did full coloring in digital and that works very well too. So we talked a little bit about the upcoming issue of World War III. Uh, do you want to say anything more about that, about some of the contributors you have coming sure. on board? Sure, it's um, called Frontlines of Repair and it's our first post-Trump issue of World War III. And it's a hopefully our post-pandemic issue of World War III. And it's about the idea of repairing the world we live in, fixing it. Um, and we've got a beautiful co cover by Paula Hewitt, who's an artist who's been working at World War III Illustrated since issue four. She's a longtime World War III artist who hasn't gotten the attention she should get. And she's gonna have a full color section in the issue of paintings about young people she works with, building a community garden and doing ecological restoration work. Um, fully painted, beautiful section. Um, and that's the centerpiece of the issue is Paula's work. Um, I'm very proud to be showing that. Um, we're gonna have a nice piece by Ben Catcher um, who we've known for many years and who helped us with the first issue, in fact, but we're gonna have a comic strip by him um, with his usual irony. Uh, we're gonna have some pieces by Sue Coe, by Peter Cooper, uh, a lot of material from um, 
Kevin Pyle, who's an amazing artist. Um, I have a couple pieces that will probably go in, we'll see. Sabrina Jones has done a really nice piece. Um, not a usual piece. She did a funny animal comic for us with like a, a talking rabbit and stuff like that, which is not what she usually does. But, you know, we're all kind of trying to break out of our usual screaming angry mode and say, can we find something positive to say, uh, something we can suggest to fix the world as well as to tear down what's oppressive. So that's what we're trying to do with this issue. How do you usually find the collaborators and the contributors for World War III? Do you have a pool of talent that you usually go to? Or once you come up with a theme, do you solicit uh, contributions? I will tell you that the thing that has most attracted me to people is when they put their own work out there. Um, when I met Eric Drucker and Paula Hewitt, they were publishing this little pamphlet, this little book called USA at War at Home and Abroad. It was a little comic book they'd put out with a red cover, um, you know, Xerox zine, where um, they showed, you know, on one page, this is the oppression the US does in Nicaragua, and the next page, this is the police shooting Michael Stewart in the United States, you know? Um, and they put out this little comic book and I was like, hey, we, I gotta work with you guys. And Eric Drucker had also put out a whole series of posters about the police murder of Michael Stewart, which had a big effect on everyone in this community. Um, so I was aware that Eric and Paula were out there putting their work out there, had something to say, weren't waiting for somebody to tell them to do it or to authorize them to do it. Um, when I became aware of Scott Cunningham, it was right after the 1988 police riot. And he had witnessed the 1988 police riot in Tompkins Park, sitting on a fire escape that overlooked the park. And he'd done all these drawings of it. And then he photocopied them, made them into posters and pasted them up all over the Lower East Side. And I was like, wow, we gotta get this guy. You know, and that was how I got to know Scott Cunningham. Um, I got to know um, Carlo Quispe because we had um, a political arts group against the first Gulf War and Carlo joined that group and he was doing banners against the first Gulf War. Um, I got to know Ethan Heitner because I was at a demonstration against the Israeli bombing of Gaza and someone handed me this flyer about boycotting uh, Israeli products. And I saw it was a comic strip and I said, did you draw this? They said, no, but I know the guy who does. I said, here, give him my phone number. And that's how I met Ethan Heitner. Um, so the idea that somebody is a self-starter, a self-publisher, puts their work out there. Um, same thing with Fly. She used to put out a little zine called Fly, which were little cards that she would hand out to people. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. You know. To me, the fact that somebody has a message and they want to get it out to people makes them a good person for World War III Illustrated to be part of our collective because that's what our collective does. So I've looked for those people first and foremost. That said, you know, when we get together to work on an issue, we will also say, who is there out there we'd like to get? And because there are a lot of different editors, you have very different streams of people coming in. For instance, Ethan Heitner uh, made us aware of all of these comic book artists in the Arab countries, like Magdi Al Shafi, um, Mohammed Savana, um, Ahmed Nadi, and brought all these people into the magazine who I never would have known about. But you know, through the internet and through social media. Um, Ethan, who's a lot younger than I am, picked up on those guys and said, hey, these people are doing political art about the Arab Spring. They should be in World War III. And so they came into the magazine. Um, you know, so people come in by a lot of different routes and wind up working on the magazine. So as we're finishing up, 
Can you tell people how they can follow your work online and get in contact with you? Okay. You can find out more about me and my work from my website, which is sethtabachman.com. Um, if you want to get an, a hold of me, uh, you can email me at uh, sethtabachmanartist at gmail.com or sethbusiness at yahoo.com. Um, if you want to buy my books, most of them are sold by AK Press. And World War III is now sold by AK Press. So you go to the AK Press website, you'll find most of my books. Um, some of the other books are sold by their publishers. Um, War in the Neighborhood is um, published by uh, Ad Astra Comics, and you can order it from them. Um, and um, the French uh, publications are from CMDE, a uh, French publishing company. Um, you can look them up online. You'll find them. Um, yeah, that's the way to find my work. If you, if you want, you know, to buy reproductions of some of my work, I do have posters of several pieces that I can sell to you. Um, if you email me, um, the most popular thing is a poster that said, um, the government does not care. We, the people will help each other, uh, which became, was a poster I did, uh, in response to, um, the, uh, rebuilding of New Orleans by volunteer organizations, but it now seems to apply to COVID response as well. Um, so I do sell posters of that. If you want to get one, you can email me about it and I'll, we'll work that out. Um, I'm very open to doing commissions on various book projects. I just did an animated video um, for, to publicize Eric Larson's new book, The Operating System. It's not out yet, but it should be out soon. So yeah, get a hold of me. And what about social media? Are you active at all on Twitter or Instagram or anything like that? Did you say you have a Twitter page? Seth Bachman on Twitter. Excellent. Is there anything else you want to say? Um, well, I appreciate your questions. I appreciate that you know, you've done a really good job here of interviewing me and asking serious questions about the artwork. Um, I think comics is still an expanding medium. I think the best things that could be done with comics still haven't been done. I think some of the most interesting comics being done right now are coming out of uh, the parts of the world that we used to refer to as the third world, which we now refer to as the global south. Really interesting artists are somebody like Mohammed Sabana, um, who's just done his first graphic novel, who's a Palestinian cartoonist, or Magdi Al Shafi, whose graphic novel Metro is considered the first Arab language graphic novel. Um, you know, um, also Orijit Sen from India. There's a lot of interesting comics being done that don't get a lot of publicity. Um, particularly comics coming out of the, again, what we used to call the third world. Um, people were really taking the idea of alternative comics to the next level. Uh, there's a really interesting publishing company that started during the pandemic called Street Noise Books. They have an amazing series of new books out. Um, they published Mohammed Sabana's book, uh, Power Born of Dreams. Um, they published uh, Jim Terry's book, Come Home Indio. Um, they published a book by Woodrow Phoenix called Crash Course, which is an amazing graphic book about the dangers of the automobile. Um, you gotta check this stuff out. There's really interesting things happening out there. Comics are growing and developing. Um, it's, a, it's a really inspiring time to be a comic book artist. From your work with World War III, which was started under 
the Reagan administration to some of your recent work, which has dealt with, you know, the, the way uh, the things that have happened under Trump and COVID and things like that. Um, are you optimistic at all about, about social change and about the world getting better? Well, I'll put it this way. Cynicism is not a revolutionary position. Um, saying everything is just getting worse is not a revolutionary position. Um, you know, we can make observations of what's going on and we should be critical and we should say, we should be honest about climate change. We should be honest about COVID. We should not be in denial about these things. But the use of that observation is that we believe we have the potential to do something about it. We believe we have the potential to get to work and fix things. So I am constantly um, looking for what can people do about it? How can people fix the problem? Um, you know, um, so in that sense, I am always an optimist. You know, we figured out by the time we were on like the third or fourth issue of World War III Illustrated that it wasn't enough to describe a problem. We had to present solutions or we were just adding to the degree of cynicism that was very much a part of the Reagan era. Um, and so I'm always looking for what people can do about it. In terms of my personal life, you know, of course, I'm a man in his 60s. And by the time you're 60, if you don't regret anything, you probably didn't do anything. Um, so, you know, I'm going to wake up in the morning saying, oh, man, I fucked this up. I fucked this up. I fucked this up. But I got to get up in the morning and figure out what am I going to do with the rest of the day? You know, what am I going to, how am I going to make things work and apply myself to things? And that's a constant struggle, you know, because to be alive is to try to make things better, you know, and that's what we do on this earth. So in that sense, I am committed to optimism. You know, I, you know, I'm going to be realistic about what's going on in the world. We have a pandemic, we have a climate catastrophe, it's already upon us. Um, we have you know, this nightmarish Republican party and this really problematic Democratic party, you know, um, and this capitalist system that doesn't want to change even though it's strangling us and strangling itself. So, you know, we have a lot of problems, you know, but, um, we have to look at those and say, what are we going to do? You know, and that's always the question is what are we going to do? And I try to do art that points towards what we can do. So one last related question off mic, we, we discussed uh, your work and the way your work has shown uh, how comics as a medium can can delve into larger issues and more important issues. As somebody who grew up on superhero comics, like I think a lot of people listening to this podcast did, do you feel a responsibility to use your talent, to use your work uh, to address these larger issues as opposed to doing something that's more commercial, more entertaining, more, I don't know, that has maybe a, a wider uh, reach? Well, I can't do anything that I don't believe in and like and feel. You know, when I was a kid, I felt like the Submariner was a real guy. I really felt that way, you know? And if I made up an imaginary superhero in my head, they felt real to me. And, you know, God forbid, I thought that the women in Frank Frazetta paintings could be real women, you know? <laughs> Um, and when I no longer feel that way, I have to do something that's honest, that's real, that represents the way I look at the world. So that's going to change. That's going to develop. And I'm going to show something that represents the way the world is for me. 
you know, when I was in my 20s, I thought in very simple, bold terms about like fighting the man and getting out there. And then when I was, you know, 30, 35, I had a more complicated way of looking at it because I had some experience fighting the system and I found that it wasn't so easy, you know? So I had to do a different book. And so I have to do a different story now. It's not that I feel an obligation, I must do this. I feel like this is the only work I can do is to do work that, you know, honestly comes from me. You know, this is not a suit I'm putting on, this is me. I'm not pretending to do this. This is what I do, you know, and it's the only thing I can do. You know, and um, so, I mean, I do political work because politics is real to me. I do personal work because my personal life is real to me. You know, um, I use my imagination because my imagination is how I understand the world I live in. Um, But I don't do these things because, oh, I think people should do this, you know. I do them because I believe in them because they're real to me. Excellent. That's a great place to leave off. Thank you so much, Mr. Tabachman. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you soon.